Uh, Richard, I am so glad that we were able to make this happen. Good evening, my friends. Good to have you here. Well, there's a lot going on, and so many people have been focused on what's happening in the States, but a major accomplishment has just happened in Iraq. The war on ISIS has taken a, a major step forward, and we've been focusing on that for the last several weeks. So it's good to join you and uh, join the people at home. Looking forward to your report, at Richard. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rachel, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. And welcome to Erbil in northern Iraq, where the sun is just coming up. Uh, we're here because for the last several weeks, we've been covering the fight to drive ISIS from the city of Mosul, which is about 50 miles away. The fighting isn't entirely over yet. There are still small but fierce pockets of resistance. But it is fair to say that ISIS, the best armed, most dangerous terrorist group in the world, has lost its biggest city. The self-declared caliphate, the so-called Islamic State, is no more. ISIS still holds some territory, including the city of Raqqa in Syria, but that is not a state, and Raqqa is now surrounded on all sides. Defeating the Islamic State is perhaps the biggest accomplishment of American foreign policy in years. But there were no big announcements from the White House, no mission accomplished moment. If you watched our reports from here, you already know that Iraqi troops did most of the ground fighting. The same Iraqi army that once fled from ISIS stood up, fought hard, and won. But make no mistake, that only happened because American troops were deeply involved in this battle at every stage. As we will show you tonight, American firepower cleared the path for Iraqi soldiers, and the Americans provided a constant stream of intelligence, logistics, and planning. It wouldn't have happened without us. The question we will try to answer tonight is whether the end of ISIS in Mosul brings us any closer to ending our commitment here, or will it just draw us deeper into a failed state? We left Iraq once before. In 2012, when U.S. troops pulled out, the American people were promised that the Iraqi army and police, the ones we spent blood and treasure to train, were ready to hold this country together on their own. It took less than two years for that promise to be broken. ISIS first rolled into Mosul in the summer of 2014. A few hundred fighters armed with little more than rifles and a terrifying reputation. That was enough. Almost without a fight, 30,000 Iraqi soldiers and 30,000 more police officers trained and armed by the U.S. turned tail and ran, leaving behind their powerful American-made weapons. ISIS was suddenly the best armed terrorist group in history. Its fighters rolled from city to city in American Humvees, picking up recruits, some of them young children, along the way. They crossed the border into Syria, effectively creating a new state of their own, which they called the Islamic State. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, stepped up to the pulpit or minbar of the Grand al-Nuri Mosque in Mosul and declared himself the leader of that state, the emir of the so-called caliphate. His men raised their black flag on the ancient leaning minaret and swore that Mosul would be theirs forever. There has been a massive wave of people fleeing their homes. The fear here is that this is just the beginning. In response, American troops were sent to Iraq again with a new mission that sounded a lot like the old one, to train, equip, and get the Iraqi army back on its feet and put American firepower behind it. Late last year, the Iraqi army started moving on Mosul. They quickly raced through the open ground around the city. ISIS fought hard for every inch of ground. We climbed into one of the Iraqi Special Forces' old American Humvees. It's battle-worn, shot up, and the driver said damaged by an ISIS suicide bomber today. Then it was on foot, quickly, because rounds whizzed by. But it was in the city itself that the fighting got ugly. Iraqi forces, backed by massive American firepower, took the city street by street, house by house. ISIS had years to prepare for this and was willing to use every dirty trick. Human shields, booby traps, grenade-carrying drones, and many suicide bombers to try to hold on. By late June, ISIS fighters were in full retreat. They chose to blow up the Nuri Mosque, along with the black flag that once hung from it. The battle had come down to this tiny piece of Mosul, the old city, where ISIS fighters decided to make their last stand. When we came back to Mosul a couple of weeks ago, the city was almost unrecognizable. ISIS militants were, and still are, fighting to the death for each and every house. 
We expected that, and we knew that there was no way the Iraqi army, backed by the might of American firepower, was going to lose the battle. What we weren't prepared for was the price the people of Mosul would have to pay. This is what victory in Mosul looks like. A city the size of Philadelphia reduced to rubble. Its people dead, injured, or displaced. And this is the old city where the last remnants of the ISIS fighters hold up. Colonel Patrick Work from the 82nd Airborne Division is the ranking American officer in the area. At this point, the Iraqi security forces have their really have their heel on the throat of ISIS, and they're about to finish them off here in the next several days. What's the fight been like from, from your vantage point? It's extraordinarily violent. And never in my lifetime have I seen close combat like this. We're talking about 20-meter gunfights, hand grenade range all the time, and it's extraordinarily complex. But work generally sees the battle from far above the fray on live feeds from drones fed into control centers in the rear, where his men order up artillery strikes. Airstrikes in close support. This time around, the battle on the ground is left to the Iraqi soldiers. So, to see the fight up close, we joined a unit from the 16th Division of the Iraqi Army inside the old city. Their commander, Major Ibrahim Radi, gave us a quick briefing about what we could expect up ahead. They had hostages in the house. He's saying that this is the way the fighting generally works here. Very narrow streets. There's some ISIS bodies up ahead. And he said what they've been doing is they've been holding hostages in their houses, using them as human shields and fighting uh, as, as the Iraqi soldiers approach. We saw some of those human shields emerge like ghosts from the rubble. Injured, terrified, but alive. And finally free to escape. Overcome by the stench of death, we followed the soldiers right to their front line and into a house. Soon, a gun battle erupted. We rushed upstairs to find the Iraqi soldiers engaged in a firefight. Private Bakker explained that the enemy was just next door in a house full of civilians. Street fighting. We're on this rooftop here. They say that the ice village are maybe 50 yards ahead maximum. So they're putting down some suppressive fire so that the ground forces can advance further on them. But the Iraqis weren't even trying to aim, they were just laying down fire. So when finally the gun battle died down, we assumed there could be no survivors. <laughs> But there were. The soldiers helped them out of the house they'd been trapped in for weeks, lifting them to safety and treating them with kindness, but also with caution. Men were searched and questioned. There is no easy way to tell insurgents from civilians. We were just about to go into the next house when a grenade exploded. Private Bakker and three others came back injured, one very seriously. This is what makes this battle so difficult. The soldiers are under attack by some of the very people they're fighting to rescue. When we got back to the command center, a meeting was underway. The senior Iraqi general was telling his commanders that the fight was going too slowly, demanding that they push harder. Colonel Work sat and listened quietly, respectfully letting the Iraqi commander discipline his officers. How are you? Holy cow. Outside, he told me the meeting was pretty intense. So you're in the final days of this final push against ISIS. They fought their ass off for eight and a half months right now to get to this point. And they're not pleased with the tempo with which the attack is happening right now in these final several days. So what are you going to do? Are you going to push, go harder, faster? What happens now? Well, really, it's, it's what do they choose to do. It's all there for what them. What did they choose to do? It's all there for them. As we climbed into his cramped armored vehicle, I asked Colonel Work about the challenges the Iraqi soldiers are facing, telling good guys from bad on the battlefield. ISIS has had a very deliberate campaign 
to put humans as obstacles between the advancing security forces, but creating uncertainty amongst the army, amongst the police, amongst the commandos, that these civilians that we're attempting to rescue may present a threat to us because you've embedded a bomber in them. And that creates some advantages for ISIS. But what possible benefit, military benefit, could ISIS get by attacking a bunch of women and children in their own town? Yeah. And I suspect that ISIS really has very little regard for anybody who doesn't share their deformed worldview. So anybody who's attempting to escape is not one of them. Therefore, their life is meaningless. And civilians have been used as cover. Recent reports have suggested that American airstrikes indiscriminately killed civilians, but Colonel Work kept calling it precision fire. When you walk around the old city, it looks like the place was carpet bombed. How can you have so much precision fire and yet so much devastation? Because the Islamic State fighters who occupied those buildings took someone's home, took someone's uh, school, and turned it into a fighting position. That's how that happens. It was precise. The strike hit exactly where it was supposed to. Precision or not, the fact of the matter is that large parts of this city have been flattened by American munitions. We will never know how many people were killed by airstrikes or Iraqi soldiers or how many ISIS killed with explosives. What we do know is that this fight was not just about territory. It was a race to save lives. When we rejoin Major Roddy and his men on the front lines the next day, they were pinned down. Major Roddy says that four ISIS gunmen are holed up in a mosque around the corner. They're holding civilians hostage, he says, to protect themselves, shooting at them when they try to escape. With his men firing over their heads, the residents start to escape. They walk dazed into the arms of their rescuers. Some of these children have never experienced anything but war and siege. Like six-month-old Ahmed, malnourished and dehydrated in the 120-degree heat. He doesn't know it yet, but he's an orphan now. Even the battle-scarred soldiers are overwhelmed. These people are free now, but they've lost everything. In the chaos, one of the soldiers grabs two men and accuses them of being ISIS members. They're dragged into a house for interrogation. How do you know them, I asked the soldier. They're my neighbors, he says. The old one preached the ISIS message, and this one is his son. They killed my friend. These soldiers clearly want to take revenge on these prisoners, but with our camera around, they don't. That's good. We'd seen them detain another prisoner, and after they told us to stop filming, heard his anguish cries. Other Iraqi units have done far worse. We obtained a disturbing cell phone video showing soldiers from another unit beating prisoners. The video ends with two of them thrown off a cliff and shot to death. Major Roddy generally spent very little time interrogating prisoners. He had bigger things to worry about. His men were still exchanging fire with the ISIS fighters in the mosque. So he deployed the most powerful weapon he has, the radio. He called in an airstrike. So what? Spanish so what? A few miles away, in a control center, American and Iraqi officers were watching the live feed from an overhead drone. They checked the coordinates, strike is deconflicted the airspace, and to prove the attack. And an aircraft delivered the payload on the mosque just 50 yards from our position. The major and his men moved a few steps forward. On the battlefield of Mosul, that counted as a good day. Is ISIS going to be able to point, or ISIS supporters online, to the debris of Mosul and say, look what the Americans and the Shia government did to this Sunni city and use it as a rallying cry. Oh, uh, absolutely, because ISIS continued to take every single home and turn it into a fighting position. Don't forget, ISIS is the blame. ISIS came in and hijacked the people of Mosul. I, I can't imagine any reasonable argument that anybody but ISIS is responsible for the vast destruction of Mosul at this point. 
and we applaud and we congratulate the Iraqi security forces for coming back and returning Mosul to the people. The Iraqi Prime Minister was quick to come to Mosul, wearing a military-style uniform and proudly announcing that from the heart of a free and liberated city, we announce absolute victory. But to call this a free and liberated city is an insult to the people of Mosul who have lost their lives and their homes. And the absolute victory was achieved with a massive amount of support from 1,600 American servicemen who risked their lives, clearing bombs ahead of advancing Iraqi forces, calling in airstrikes, nearly 9,000 of them, and providing a constant stream of intelligence, support, and encouragement. It still wouldn't have been able to complete this mission without a lot of American help. No, we did this together, and this is a coalition of many. But the important part about this coalition is the first member of the coalition is the Iraqi security forces. They assume 99.9% .9 of the physical risk daily. Well, what happens if the Americans, American military, stops helping them? Do they fall apart well, again? We're not going to stop helping them. We're going to continue. I'm fully confident that we're going to continue to follow the decisive operation and help the Iraqis dominate. For how long? Do you I have don't to, know. Do you have to stay with them? Forever? I don't know how long it's going to take. It's a rock. It's complicated. But we're going to be here to help them because our common enemy is ISIS, and we're going to continue to help them attack ISIS. When does the United States' commitment to Iraq finally end? I don't want to take a stab at American foreign policy, and I don't pretend to have a crystal ball. What I will say is we're fighting a common enemy here. We can't do it without them. They certainly can't do it without us. ISIS lost Mosul, but where is its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? The simple answer is, we don't know. There have been repeated rumors that he's been killed. Some say the Russians killed him in Syria. Others that a U.S. airstrike in Mosul got him. At this point, we can't confirm any of these rumors. Most likely, they are a combination of wishful thinking and a crude attempt to get the elusive al-Baghdadi to step out of the shadows. U.S. officials don't think he's in Mosul, but one source told me there are teams on standby watching the city closely, just in case. Next up, Andrea Mitchell looks back at the way American presidents, three so far, managed the war in Iraq and asks some of the key architects of the American strategy when and if the mission will ever truly be accomplished. Plus, treating the injured in Mosul, an American medic and an Iraqi doctor, their extraordinary work to save lives. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.